Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where sales leaders teach you what's working for them so you can build it yourself. This episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast is brought to you by our sales coaching and consulting services. Are you looking to create repeatable, scalable, and predictable revenue? We've helped thousands of companies grow their business with tailored expert advice backed by testing to ensure they establish the best practices that will work for them. Head over to bit.ly forward slash predictable coaching to learn more. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart. And today I'm joined by Brisa Renteria. She's the CEO over Improved Growth. And we are going to be talking about four common misconceptions about hiring salespeople. Brisa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Colin. Thanks for coming on. I want to, before we get into, so we're going to talk about four misconceptions. Um, but one thing struck me when I was, when we were doing the kind of pre-interview and when I was doing some research on you, you've got a very data-driven approach to hiring. Before we get into the main, kind of the bulk of the episode, can you talk to me about how, when, where you use data in the hiring process? Yeah, so that's a great question. So part of the reason why we relied so much on data is that data doesn't lie right? We all look at metrics. We all go online and look at information. We love statistics, right? We buy into the statistics. We buy into numbers. And the thing about data is data just flat out smacks you in the face, which is the part that I love about data, right? It, it is very black and white, depending on how you want to interpret the information that is being provided to you. But the other piece about the data, especially when you're looking at hiring salespeople, is it helps you discover some of the underlying things you may not be able to see from a typical salesperson, right? We know that a lot of times when we're hiring for salespeople, they're going to give you the best of the best. And the reason for this is what? They're salespeople, right? They're going to be great at selling themselves. And so if I am an inexperienced sales leader or a hiring manager, and I show up and I interview salespeople, what's the piece that I'm going to be looking for? Well, I'm going to be looking at personality and salespeople know that you're going to be looking at personality. And so when they show up to the interview, what are they going to do? They're going to give you the personality that you're looking for. Right. And although there's a certain part of the process of the interview and criteria that where you do want to look at personality, it is much more important to leverage data that gives you information about that person ahead of time. So that by the time you show up and have conversations with them, you're coming significantly more equipped with information. Um, along with insights that you wouldn't know otherwise. Um, the thing about data is it helps you make that decision for you a lot of times. It's more so thinking about how do I go about interpreting that data throughout the recruiting process that's so powerful. And so what kind of data are you getting on sales folks ahead of time? Yeah, great question. So one of the pieces, one of the things that we do and that we teach our clients to to use is we use an assessment tool. It's objective management tool. They're based out of Boston. And they are sales specific, right? We all know assessments. We've all used them. Used them. We've all gone through them ourselves, right? We were familiar with the different ones. You have DISC, Myers Briggs, all these different things. The thing that I found so powerful about OMG it was two things. One, it's predictable, right? Meaning that if you were to use this tool and somebody came back recommended or worthy, it would predict and tell you, yes, this person is going to be great, or no, that person is not going to be so great. And that's extremely powerful as a hiring manager to have that information because rather than relying on your gut, you're relying on data, right? And so having a tool like that is extremely powerful. And the other piece um, about assessment tools that I find with companies is they end up hiring their own tools, right? They end up finding personality tools, behavioral tools, assessment tools. And although they're great, they are not self-specific. And so one of the things that we provide on this data is it gives you insights into actual sales skills. It gives you data into actual sales motivation. It gives you data into actual commitment to be successful in sales. So it is very targeted to the sales industry. Um, and so it's you don't have to interpret things, right? It's interpreted for you. You just have to go through the process, trust the findings, and then actually see that salesperson perform against those findings. I love that. Can I don't know if they if Objective Management Group would be okay with you sharing, but can you give me a sense of like what is the cost on something like that for me to expect? Like I've seen anywhere from like twenty bucks per candidate to a couple hundred dollars per candidate. Yeah, kind of a rough it, sense. It depends on the number of hires, right? So yeah. the more 
say that you were going out and hiring one salesperson, well, the cost for that is different. However, it works off of a license model, meaning that depending on the number of salespeople that you're going to hire, you would have access to that assessment for six to 12 months, depending again on the number of hires that you have. So as far as price point, it could be anywhere between 4,000 plus. Um, and this is unlimited testing for the period of the time in which you buy the license. Okay. I gotcha. So it's it's like an annual license kind of thing and you use it to hire for the year. Yeah. 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 I see. Okay, cool. It's super interesting. I'm, I was definitely looking on their site and I'm like, oh, I don't see pricing. And when I don't see pricing, it's usually like, ah, oh, shit, this is 30 grand. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth every penny, Colin. It's one of the things that I tell people whenever I'm talking to them and they see the price point, right? And they say, oh my gosh, this is so expensive. And it's expensive relative to what? right? Is it relative to just the price by itself? No issues, no problems. You're hiring all the right people. You always get it right. They're performing at a level that you want them to. They uh, make up their money and more within the first three months. If so, yeah, sure, it's expensive. But if in us having a conversation, you share that you're missing out on all these opportunities. You're constantly hiring. You're onboarding people who are not performing. You have all these opportunity costs. Um, you can't seem to get it right then yeah, it's expensive relative to what, right? And so, but I agree with you. Typically, a lot of times when the pricing's not there, it does mean that there's a significant investment to make. 100%. And uh, yeah, it, it, my my old mentor, Joel, would give me a tough time about being penny wise and pound foolish. Uh, hmm. Or anyway, uh, basically pension pennies and not, not investing where I should. Um, and I think this could be one of those areas. Like we've spent a number of, uh, we've spent, yeah, we've bought a bunch of different assessment tools. And, you know, the what color is your this and what personality type and this and that. And it's like, okay, well, yeah, they're not very instructive. Does this is this fairly like help me understand the the advantage here? Like what is it what does it do differently than say the any of the like sixteen personalities or the strengths finders or the um any of those types of Myers Briggs? Yeah. Great question. I'm so glad you're asking this, Colin, because I love to geek out on OMG. So my company started out as a recruiting company. All right. When we started and over the years that I've been in the industry, we mostly went out and I hired salespeople. And so now what we do is we go out and we teach companies the same process. And a huge part of the process is this assessment tool. And so to answer your question, the top two things that I would tell you it's different from most assessment tools, besides the fact that it's self-specific and that it's predictive, is that one is going to filter out people for you, right? Coming from a sales recruiting perspective, right? I am a huge, um, I mean, say testament to how many people come through the pipeline, all right? I have hired, I think the biggest volume that we ever had in our company over the last three years, we had something like 16 people that we had to hire in a short amount of time. And to hire 16 people, in a short amount of time means that you are building a huge pipeline, right? Mm -hmm. And so this huge pipeline, what do I do with them, right? Do I just filter through resumes? And that's the other thing is resumes, how much in the resume is actually true. The first thing that we do is we'll put everyone through the assessment, then we let the assessment do the filtering for us. So one of the things the assessment does really great that no other assessment does out there, especially with it being so specific, is it will actually tell you, Colin, we recommend you to have a conversation with this person. We do not recommend you to have a conversation with this person based on their skill sets, based on their motivation levels, based on their level of desire to be in sales. And so take a pool of 500 people that you may have in your pipeline and the assessment itself might be able to filter out 400 of them, which means I only have 100 people to talk to, right? So the fact that it does that, it's extremely powerful, especially since it is predictive, right? The other thing that the assessment does really well that a lot of assessments don't is it talks about sales DNA, all right? So back when I was a sales trainer, right, I, I worked for a sales training company for a long time and we strictly did, did sales training, sales leadership training. And typically when we talk to CEOs, they would say, teach my people how to close more business, teach them how to knock on doors, teach them how to qualify, give them the skills, right? 
And that's exactly what we would do. We would go around, do a boot camp, do a 12-week program, do a six-week program, whatever it was to teach people the skills. And what I found was that, say, out of a group of 10 salespeople, one or two were going to get better, right? And the other did it at that, right? Sometimes none of them got better. And that's terrible, right? Because you as the owner, you have made the investment, not only monetarily, but you put a lot of resources, you put a lot of time into making a salesperson be more effective. But the reality is you are focused on the wrong things, right? So you may be giving people the right skills, but are they even the right people to give those skills to, right? Do they have the desire to be in sales? We find that a lot of salespeople, they like the idea of being sales, but they really don't, right? There's a certain level of commitment and motivation that you need to have in order for you to be a successful salesperson. We found that a lot of salespeople didn't have that. And then most importantly, we also found that although we were teaching people all these skills, we found that they had a lot of internal weaknesses that would stop them from executing on those skills, right? So mm -hmm. as an example of that, all right, could be, and we would get this all the time is teach my people how to close more business. Great. Let's do a two-day boot camp on how to qualify, how to kick the conversation off, how to ask the right questions, when to close, what questions to ask, yada, 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 right? Go through the same process. By the time that training session was over, they now have the skills. And then later a week goes by, two weeks go by, and they still haven't executed. And so the question becomes, why? Why hasn't this person executed when I just took you to training, right? I just sent you off to training and you know what to do. And the salesperson may be able to tell you frontwards and backwards what are the things they need to be doing, yet they still won't do it. And so the question becomes, why? Why are they not doing it? And the reason for that is we all, right, myself, yourselves, and everybody else out there, we all have internal weaknesses that stops us from executing on the things. So going back to the example, say that I'm going out there and I'm teaching you how to close business and you have the skills, but say that internally you have a high need for approval, all right? High need for mm -hmm. approval, the way that we define it is that high need to be liked and in severe cases, loved. And people with a need for approval, they're great at making friends. They're great at building rapport. They're great at getting in the door. But what's the thing that you think they're not going to be doing? They're not going to be closing business, right? Because closing business requires a level of questions that you need to ask. Sometimes they need to be hard questions. Sometimes they need to be more in-depth questions. And not only that, closing requires you to ask for a close. And so if I have a high need for approval, and I want people to like me, what's the last thing I'm going to be doing is closing because I don't want to seem across as pushy. I don't want to take you to a place where you may not necessarily want to go. I may not want to ask you a question that I have to ask, but I'm afraid that it's going to upset you. So although I know that I have to close and I may have the skills, the fact that I have that need to be liked is what's going to stop me from actually going for the close. Love that. So OMG covers all of those things. Sorry. And, and I was just, I was thinking initially, I was like, oh, these are really easy to game. You know, you know, do you like sales? Cool. Do you like talking to people? Great. But when you're asking things like, do you need to be loved or, uh, you know, those kinds of things, that's probably a little bit harder to fake than a, uh, hmm. Yeah. Because if you ask, if you ask a salesperson point blank, do you know how to close? Are you a good closer? Is what I oftentimes hear clients ask whenever we're first kicking off a project. I'll shadow them and, and see what kind of questions they ask. One of the questions yeah. that they'll ask is, one, they're going to ask yes or no questions, which that's a big no-no. But then the other thing that they're going to ask is, are you a good closer? Yeah. If you are a salesperson interviewing for the job, what are you going to say? Are you going to say, no, I suck at closing? <laughs> if you're on a you're first not. date and the... And and the person asks, are you good in bed? You're not going to say no. <laughs> You're going to say, I'm great. Uh, yes. Best. <laughs> I am the greatest. Yes. So it's the same thing in sales, right? So for you to ask a yes or no question is a huge no, no. But for you to ask the question of, are you a good closer? They're going to say, of course I am. And then you go in and you fall in love with them and you say, great, you're hired because you are, you told me you're a great closer. And then they show up and they can't close for nothing. Right? So Asking them is not the answer when you're hiring for salespeople. It's more so what is it that they are doing throughout the process that helps you determine whether or not that person can actually close. 
Totally. And I think something like that is especially helpful for those in the founder-led selling role where they may not necessarily have experience hiring salespeople. They're probably the, this is, this might be their first foray into sales and can be a real struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why even more so it's very important to have a hiring process, right? I was to your point, Colin, I was having, I, I was working with a client earlier this year. The company had just uh, promoted an HR person into an HR director type role. And part of their job description was going to be to go out there and hire sales talent. Well, this particular person didn't come from sales, right? So she didn't know the structure of what are the different titles? What do they do differently? Uh, what are they typically held accountable to? What are they experience from a sales perspective? What level of rejection? Yeah, what metrics mean? And so because they didn't have that experience as background, to give someone like that the responsibility to go out and get sales is you're setting them up for failure, right? Because they don't know what to look for, right? So if I don't know what to look for, what am I going to do, Colin? I'm going to look for personality. I'm going to be asking yes or no questions. I'm going to be asking people whether or not they can close. And of course, these are salespeople. They're going to say, yes, of course I can close. And so very powerful to have a process so that not only are you able to help people who may not necessarily come from sales, but the thing about a process is the process itself should work in a way in which you may end up, again, using the example of 500 salespeople in the pipeline. You might have, the thing about a process, you might end up with a pipeline of 500 people mm -hmm. and through you taking people through every single step in the process, you should be filtering people out. So you should go from 500 people to 100 people to 50 people to 25 people to 10 people to two people to one person, right? Um, most companies don't function that way, right? And most companies are doing the personality and let's use DISC as an assessment. And I love DISC, but not for sales. Um, and let's ask yes or no questions and let's fall in love with them and then we'll see, right? A process is really one of those things that's going to help mitigate some of that. And I want to get to process, but you said something interesting about, I'm, I'm thinking back to the example of an HR person or a founder or a first time sales leader mm -hmm. that has never, somebody who hasn't hired that many salespeople before, or even like myself, like I spent most of my life in sales before I started PR. And then I had to turn around and go hire a bunch of people to try and figure out how to hire people. My initial reaction was I'll just hire people that are just like myself. Turns out people like myself, including myself are terrible. And it was, <laughs> it was a bad idea. How, how do I figure out, and I mean, I shouldn't say entirely terrible, but to hire 10 Collins would be a horrible idea for any organization, <laughs> let alone mine. Obviously we want a diverse talent pool. How do we, how do I figure out if I'm, you know, a first time seller, first time sales leader for, you know, CEO, how do I figure out what is the right type of person to be that we should be looking for? Yeah. Great question. So one of the things that I, that I tell clients when we're going through this exercise is we first have to figure out what would it take for someone to be successful in your business, all right? Your business is different than any business out there. And as cliche as it sounds, it really is. Most companies think, for example, I have a lot of clients in the manufacturing space, and in talking to them, they say, well, we just need somebody who's great in manufacturing. They've been successful in the manufacturing industry, right? Okay, that can be part of the criteria that we look for, but your manufacturing company, say that you manufacture cups, your cup manufacturing company is different than the next ma cup manufacturing company, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is your target is different. Your sales cycle is different. Your price point is different. Your The title of person that you go after is different. Your sales cycle is different. Your level of resistance is different. And so to put yourself in the same bucket as the people in your competition, the same pool, pool, the same pool as your competition, does not help you in figuring out what's the right person to go after, right? And so instead, the first thing you have to look at, right, is you have to ask yourself the question of, what would it take for someone to be successful in my business, right? Given the type of people that I target, given the price point in which we sell, given the sell cycle that it takes us to close, given the level of resistance that we have. That's the criteria that you look for, right? And so when you're going out there and you're hiring for salespeople, you have to hire salespeople who have already been successful doing that, right? You have to find people who have already been successful, say that 
say that you determine that in order for someone to be successful in your business, um, in your business, say you sell to CEOs, say that you sell once one call close, say that you sell premium price and say that um, the level of resistance is really high, right? Mm -hmm. You have to find someone who has already been successful selling to CEOs, selling a premium product, selling the one called close, and selling in a high resistant level type sale, right? Because that person has both the DNA to make it happen, and then two, they have the skill sets to do that. One of the biggest mistakes that I see companies make when it comes to hiring salespeople is they meet a salesperson, maybe that salesperson came in and they try to sell to them, all right? They meet them and they say, oh my gosh, you're a great salesperson, I wanna hire you. And say that this person was in insurance, right? And they were a badass at insurance, right? And you are a cup manufacturing company and you've managed to recruit that person over to your business. And again, say that you sell to CEOs, presidents, business owners, you're selling something really premium priced, and say that you have a really high level of resistance and you go out and you hire somebody who comes from insurance and say that that person was selling something really cheap to end users and their sales cycle was something like nine months. That level of skill set that they have that they were really good at does not translate to the level of skill set that you want them to have, right? And so the first thing you need to figure out as a first-time sales manager, as an HR manager, is truly understanding what would it take for someone to be successful here because not every person is gonna have that skill set or that DNA or that commitment to make it happen. I like that. The um the thing I wanted to add uh, that I, I bring in from another um Jack, I can't remember his last name. Um, did a podcast with somebody a long time ago. I want to see if if I'm understanding you correctly. Basically, I think what you're saying is the experience with the sales motion and the sales motion defined as like the dollar volume or the dollar value of the product, the number of calls, the type of work, the type of people you're selling to is more important than the industry. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Again, one of the biggest misconceptions that we, we see in sales hiring is we see a lot of companies hiring based on experience. And that experience is industry experience or sales experience. And what I've learned, Colin, from interviewing a ton of salespeople is that hiring someone who has been in, tw in sales for 20 years does not mean they're going to be successful, right? If anything, a lot of times, and I've seen this, all right, a lot of times it means that they've done their first year 20 times, all right? So 20 years not a direct correlator to whether or not they could be successful, right? Yeah. And then the thing about industry experience, what I tell clients is that, because most companies are very adamant about, we want somebody say that I'm working with a banking company. We want somebody who comes from banking. Why, right? What we typically find is most companies who will hire people from the same industry, those people are going to do two things. Either one, they're only going to bring over the relationships that they already have right? So if I'm a banker and I go out and I join another bank and I have pretty well-established relationships, I am going to take those relationships from bank A, put them into bank B, call it a day, right? And then the other thing that I find is um, a lot of times people from the same industry, they carry a lot of bad habits with them, right? And so if you want to go out and create a culture of growth, if you want to go out and create a culture of excellence, not only excellence, but sales excellence of going out there, really pounding the pavement and converting and closing sales, you need to have people who not only do they need to have some level of experience, depending on what the role requires, but you want people who are open-minded enough and they're not carrying over any of that baggage from previous companies. And they're open, they're willing to put the work in to learn. Yeah. A new industry, a new sport. Yeah. As you were describing this, I was thinking, you know, to my selling career, the most fun of any new sales job is getting a chance to learn a new industry, product, set of customers. And once that excitement of learning something new was gone, I was bored. You know, I, mm -hmm. I'd say almost every sales job I had, I'd be over quota by a good margin first year, mm -hmm. second year on my way out because I was bored. I'm like, okay, I've learned all I can. You know, I want to 
I want to go do something else. I want to learn something new. Yeah. Probably not the best sales hire, but I imagine that kind of feeling of like, hey, this is something that I get a chance to learn something new, a new industry. The type of people that are going to apply for a role like that are the type of people that you want on your team. Yeah. And one of the things that you just reminded me of with uh, your example of yourself is that chances are, and, and I can see this, right? Chances are you you have a really high figure it out factor. All right. And what we what we know as figure it out factor on the OMG network is that these are people that figure stuff out really quickly. We find that salespeople who have a really high figure it out factor, which again leads to how quickly will this person figure things out, they have two things. One, they're gonna have a significantly shorter ramp up time, right? And then two, because it takes you such a short amount of time to figure things out, that means you are going to meet the goal. You're going to meet expectations and then you're going to be like, all right, what's next? And unless that person has that what's next for you, the, if they don't have that, you're going to go out and find that next challenge with the next company, right? So chances are for you, you hit the ground running, you figure stuff out really fast, you figure things out in a short amount of time, you achieve the goal, and then you were probably sitting there thinking, all right, what's next? And I'm not sure if the company had that what next for you. But mm -hmm. what I did want to share is that as an organization going out there and hiring top performing salespeople, such as yourself, you have to think in terms of what's next, right? If this person comes in here and they kill it, right? What does that next step look like for them? And most companies don't think that far out, right? Because their experience is, we typically hire people who suck, so we prepare for most salespeople who suck versus why don't we go out and figure out a plan of hiring sales badasses who succeed and what does next step look like for them, right? So mm -hmm. flipping the script a lot of times for companies is a way in which they can differentiate themselves in the process. I love that. I, I want to talk a little bit about the process because we've talked a little bit about you know how to figure out what to look for. But if I know what I'm looking for, and then I just still ro roll up and have them do the personality interview and the assessment, I'm still not going to have a, get a very good outcome. I know this because I've tried this. We used to have people do the personality assessment. Then I'd have a meeting and I'd be like, I've been in sales my whole life. I know how to find a good salesperson. And then we hired some bad salespeople. And I was like, okay, I take it back. I don't know anything about anything. <laughs> Touch my vote process and how, because it certainly helped me. I'd love to understand how do you design a process to kind of, yeah, filter the right people in and the wrong people out? Yeah, good question. So the first thing is, as we talked about, right, is you need to figure out what is it that you need. And the thing that you need is what would it take for someone to be successful in our industry? The other piece of it all, too, which is why assessments, and in particular that assessment has been so powerful for us, is the right assessment is going to help you figure out who to focus on and who not to focus on. Right. It was very powerful for us as a recruiting company to go from 500 candidates to 100 candidates. Right. I mean, that just cut our time by more than half. And it gave us a ton of time back for us to go after those ones that are really powerful. Um, and so getting that in the process early on would save hiring managers an extreme amount of time because you're not having to go through resumes. The other piece, right, as far as what to look for, is you have to see what people do, Colin, right? Again, most salespeople, they're going to say, yeah, I'm a great closer. Yeah, I know how to build rapport. Yeah, I make a thousand calls a day, right? And again, what are they doing? They're selling themselves, right? And then they show up in a completely different person. And, and so if we know that, right? then we can better prepare ourselves for how do we go about figuring out whether or not that person actually does those things. And so the best predictor of success is for you to figure out what is it that they're doing now, right? How do they go about conducting themselves? And how is it that they're going to conduct themselves by the time they get in front of my prospect? So one of the things that we teach our clients to do through our programs is Number one, not only do you need to make sure that you're asking the right questions, but two, it's how you ask the question that's more powerful than the question that you ask, right? So it's, sometimes it's not the question itself. Sometimes it's how you go about asking the question and how is it that that person reacts to one, the question that you asked and two, the way in which you ask that question. 
So as an example of this, yeah, as an example of this, right? Um, people who are uncomfortable uh, with rejection, right? Say that I am a salesperson and one of my weaknesses is I can't handle rejection. I hate being rejected. So one of my questions in the interview process is it would be an objection, right? Me throwing you an objection such as, hey, Colin, I hate to break it to you, but I'm not sure that you have the level of experience that we're looking for. And then I showed up and I look at them in the eye and I just watch them react, right? What I am expecting that person to do is to do what? Overcome that objection. Yeah, my brain went, what? the F are you thinking? Of course, because I'm, I'm taking it through my role. Like, how much more experience do you need? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's for you, right? Because you, you have your own internal, internal strengths yeah. and weaknesses. But most salespeople who cannot handle rejection, right, they'll either shut down completely and they'll say, okay, well, great. Thank you so much for your time or whatever it may be, right? And by them reacting that way, they just told me everything that I need to know, right? Is the moment that the client or the prospect gives you an objection, I know I now know what you're going to do. You're going to fold and you're going to say, great, thanks so much for your time. See you later. Versus what we want is we want kind of what you just mentioned, right? Is we want someone to say, what are you even talking about, right? I am the right person because A, B, C, or D, right? And, and so in you doing that, right, what you just showed me is what you are likely to do with your prospects, right? You are likely to overcome that objection. One, challenge it in the professional, nice way. But then two, overcome it in the way that not only am I pushing back a bit, which pushing back in the sales process is not a bad thing as long as you do it at the right time in the right way, right? Mm. But you are showing me that not only can you push back, which shows me not a need for approval, but then two, you also show me that you are able to overcome those objections. So in the hiring process, Sure, having great questions is important, but again, it's how you ask the question and how that person reacts that's the most important. Another example is we were talking about closing earlier, right? And we asked the question of, are you a great closer? And of course, they're going to say, of course, I'm the best. Instead, right, what you need to be looking out for from a hiring perspective is you need to hear how is it that they close, right? Do they even close? Do they ask for a next step? Do they tell you, well, Colin, I believe that I am the right person for this role because of A, B, C, or D? Or Colin, based on the people that you've met so far, how do you think I rank up against them? Where am I on your list? Do you think I'm going to make it to the next step? What does that next step look like? Most salespeople, they'll just say, great, talk to you later, right? And by you doing that, you just showed me everything that I need to know about what it is that you're going to do in front of the prospect. And so watching their behavior is significantly more powerful than watching what they than hearing what they say. Interesting. And so a couple of the behavioral moments we've talked about. One is that that initial one was the, you know, telling them they're not the right candidate and seeing how they handled that. The next one is observing them through the end of the meeting, at the end of the meeting to see if they're closing on next steps, to see if they're digging and they're asking good questions. I'm curious, what are some of these other behavioral pieces? Because I totally wanted to ask you, give me the list of eight questions that you're looking for that you ask, but it does seem like that's the wrong question here. It's what are these behaviors that you're looking for? And so can you give me a couple more of these things that you you tend to watch for in the sales process? Yeah, yeah. So we, we look for follow-up. All right. So again, one of the questions most hiring managers ask is, are you a great at following up? And if I'm a salesperson, I'm going to say, of course I am. I follow up all the time, right? But then I never get an email from them, right? And so one of the things in watching their behavior is if they go out and they follow up with you throughout each step of the process, right? Do they follow up with you after the phone interview? Do they follow up with you after the face-to-face? -face? Do they follow up with you after you said you were going to make a decision on this date and you haven't made a decision yet? Do they follow up to see whether or not you actually made the decision? Again, watching that behavior from them with you throughout the process is going to give you insights of what are they likely to do in front of our prospect. The other thing that we do, right, is can this person figure things out, right? As salespeople, right, there's a huge element of figuring stuff out, right? There's a huge element of um, really getting out there and trying to get it, right? Mm -hmm. 
um, one of the things that we teach our clients to do through our process is how can we go about positioning this candidate to show us who they truly are at the beginning of the process, right? Before we even interview you, how do we get to know whether or not you're a person that can troubleshoot, can figure things out, and can really go out there and get it? And so one of the things that that we do in our hiring process is we will, in the note, whenever we reach out to people to schedule themselves for a phone interview, in the note, we will clearly say, Colin, looking forward to our interview. Please give me a call at this time. And what we find, right, is that a lot of them are not going to call. And so that tells you different things, right? That tells you, does this person know how to manage their calendar, right? Does this person, if this person were to have an appointment with the CEO, right, at 3 p.m., and they know they have that appointment, what are they going to do, right? Are they going to email me, uh, linked in message me? Are they going to text me? Are they going to call me? Are they going to the right salesperson, right? If I know that I have an appointment at 3 p.m., in this case, it would be an interview, right? Do I know how to get a hold of you, right? And the right salespeople, they're going to call you. They're going to email you. They're going to find you on LinkedIn. They're going to find you on Facebook. They're going to find you in all these different targets because they know that they have that appointment with you, right? And so that behavior is going to signal to you, one, do they manage a calendar? Two, do they figure stuff out? Three, if they had an appointment, can they reach that person? And then four, right? When they pick up the phone and say that they actually do pick up the phone, how do they go about quickly building a rapport with you on the phone? Because we find that a lot of times, especially on the recruiting side, the candidate is used to the recruiter calling on them versus the other way around, right? By us flipping again the script, we're getting to figure out, one, do they follow directions? But two, when you are calling on the CEO like myself, right, so that I'm the prospect, how do you go about starting the conversation? How do you go about quickly building rapport? And most importantly, how do you go about keeping my attention in a short amount of time? So that's one of the ones. There's a ton of other ones, um, but I feel like we would be here forever if I shared all the other ones. Like I could probably just spend the whole day talking about um, things here. I'll, <laughs> I'll close on the big ones here on, on this section here. So this is having the process is not necessarily about asking the right questions. Obviously, there are certain interview types and interview styles that are you know better or worse. But if you know who you're looking for, and then you're monitoring for behavioral traits like do they follow up? How do they handle rejection? How do they close on next steps? Do they ask good questions? Have they done their research ahead of time? Can they figure out how to get to that first meeting? How do they build rapport at the beginning of the call? If you answer those, these are the these are the questions that you're not asking that you really want answers to. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I love that. Again, remember it's not it's not what they say, it's what they do, right? And what they do with you is what they are likely to do with your prospects. Love that. So the interviews don't even matter. You can just show up and talk about cheese. See what they do. See what they do. <laughs> that would be a weird Betty Frill experiment. I don't think we should try it, but I'm always curious. Well, the thing about that, though, is say that you do show up in an interview and you're talking about cheese, it's going to show you how quickly that person can think on their feet. Right? Are they willing to roll through the punches? Are they able to actually have a serious conversation about cheese? Right. And although it doesn't tell you what's the likeliness of them being successful in sales, it will tell you whether or not that person could think on their feet, which, of course, there's an element to that when it comes to sales, too. Totally. And if they can make a cheese based pun throughout the conversation, they automatically get the job. Right. So yeah. Ability to build rapport. Right. Yeah. Ability to connect the dots. This is what we talked about now. This is what we're talking about next. And now I'm connecting the two. Right. So totally. it's again watching those behaviors that give you the more information about them than the resume ever will. Totally. Um, so we've talked about, you know, the kind of the behaviors, what to look for. I'm curious, you know, we talked a little bit about at the beginning, uh, personality traits, um, hiring on personality traits and experience alone don't really cut it. And so I guess, man, we kind of really talked about that though. Yeah. I'm curious on the, your last kind of thoughts on industry experience. We kind of, we, 
t- touched on it earlier that it doesn't really matter. It, what matters more is familiarity with the sales process. One of the things that I've seen in myself and in the, I guess, in being a rep is there's these type of reps that can figure it out really quickly. And there's these types of reps that already know everything and use that as an advantage to sell. Like for, I'll give you an example. When I was selling into welding, I didn't know welding at all. But Sill, one of the guys who was there, knew everything there was about welding. And was Sill a much better account rep than I was? By a thousand fold. I was mm-hmm. more responsive. I was more, I was nicer, more friendly. Nothing against Sill. He's a great guy. He was just, you know, he was an old dog, came from the welding industry. Um, and, um, but really, really, really knew his stuff. So if he was your account rep and you're like, hey, I've got this problem, well, I'm going to call Sill because Sill's going to know. You're not going to fall calling. Because if you've got uh, a weld that's failing at, you know, X pressure under this temperature, I'm not going to know that. Mm-hmm. If you only hire people like me, so like if, you, if you're not hiring for industry, you're not getting those sills. Help me understand that like how does, how does industry or something like that kind of play into it, play into how you look at hiring? Yeah, I would more so look at the role, right? What's the, what's the role look like? What's the title of it? And what are most importantly, what's the responsibilities of it? right um most companies they and and a lot of it has to do with the internet but there's not a clear definition out there of what's outside sales what's inside sales what's an account manager do what's a farmer do right they all think that it's it's a sales manager director of sales right and you think ah they're the sales manager they're the salesperson right but my point being is that a lot of times companies don't truly know what's the title that they need to label people by. And most importantly, what are those responsibilities? And so where this comes into play in the systems that we teach our, our, our clients is an account rep, an account manager is completely different than a hunter, right? The skill sets and the DNA and the commitment and the motivation and the messaging that a hunter requires is completely different than what an account manager requires, right? And so for this particular person that you were talking about, right, part of the reason why he was such a freaking good account manager is he knew his stuff when it came from the industry, right? But if you put him out there to pick up the phone, knock on doors, network, ask for the referrals, deal with the resistance, I'm not sure what level of success he may have had in that role. But my point being is, You cannot treat people, put them in the same pool as hunters because they require a different level of skill set that the hunters do, right? And so putting people on the same level and and ranking them the same is not fair because it's flat out just not the same role, nor are they the right expectations. And so truly defining what the role is and what's the title is what's going to influence what is it that you look for in the interview process? What questions do you ask? What behavior are you looking for? And most importantly, right? How do they make you feel, right? I have a client who I've helped them hire both a hunter and an account manager. For the hunter, we're looking for that. I'm going to go out there, knock on doors, make stuff happen. We're looking for that personality. We're looking for that DNA. We're looking for those skill sets, right? Because that is what's required of a hunter. For the account manager, we're looking for someone who wants to develop relationships. We're looking for someone who has a need for approval. We're looking for someone who's able to deal with account management, right? Those are two completely different skill sets and personalities versus going after a hunter who really doesn't care to build the relationship a lot of times. And most companies think that that's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing if you're hiring a hunter. It's a bad thing if you're hiring an account manager that don't care about the person, right? True. So truly defining what the role is is very important. Yeah. And I think in this case, the account manager role experience, industry experience was a whole lot more um, important in this specific niche because we were dealing with welding sounds like very simple, straightforward. You take a thing, you heat it up where you apply electricity and you weld it to another. It's actually very technical and I wasn't very good at that. So I didn't sell much of that. I was 240% of quota in my other thing that I sold, which is diesel generators or rented. um, And I totally ignored that other space, but um, it comes down to like it wasn't as a closer as somebody who is responsible for bringing in new business. That's where I should have been spending my time as opposed to uh, trying to fulfill anything on the account management side. 
Yeah. We oftentimes see this in um, professional services. So accounting, right? Um, we have an accounting company that we, we did some work for a couple of years ago. And the way that most accounting companies function, and I can speak to accounting because my husband was an accountant, is most of them, you start off as a first year, right? And then over time, you make it to manager and then director and then managing whatever and then partner, right? And depending on the size of the organization, by the time you make it to manager up, so a lot of times manager, a lot of times director, depending on the size of the business, you now have to go out there and sell. But the problem with that is now you have people who all they've done is they've done technical stuff. And now you got them going out there and selling when all they've done is been the subject matter expert. And now you take that subject matter expert and you say, hey, subject matter expert, go figure it out and go knock on doors and pick up the phone. And that person has never had that skill set, nor have they developed the DNA to do it. And so we see this a lot in the accounting industry where you take people who all they've done is accounting over the last five, six, seven years. And then after that, they have to go out and sell. And they're like, well, what the heck am I supposed to do when all I've been doing this whole time is just knowing and learning all this information so I could better answer questions. And so the part of business development fails, but the SME side is very strong. And then sometimes you see it vice versa, right? And my husband was one of those where he didn't really care to be an SME. He more so cared about the sell side. And then those people do really well on the sell side, but they suck in the SME side. But the reality of it all is you can try to be good at both, but the reality of it is you are going to lean more one way than you are at the other based on your level of skill set and based on your level of comfort. Yep. I can think of accountants lawyers and commercial real estate brokers has a couple examples of folks that we've worked for or worked with where, I mean, if you're you for commercial real estate, at least in Canada, you cannot even cold call or cold email mm. if you, unless you have a license, mm. which is like, you've got the most expensive SDRs in town. Yeah. yeah. So what do they do? Do you know what they do? Do they just LinkedIn message, direct email? Yeah. Yeah, the reps are all full cycle. You can't you can't specialize your sales roles. You couldn't have an SDR. Or I mean, I guess you could, but that SDR would have to go through quite a bit to get their commercial real estate broker's license. And if you're going to do all that, you may as well be closing because that's where the money's at. Gotcha. So. Um, yeah. Super, super interesting. I'm, I'm curious, and I feel like I could we could go on forever, but I don't want to, I don't want to make this the episode too long. So I do want to get to self-limiting beliefs. Um there are, you know, I've had examples where I've hired the right person. We've got good process. We've got good training. It feels like a really good fit, but they just can't. I've got one person in particular I'm thinking of. They just couldn't break through this one thing. They were just stuck. They're oh, no, no, I'm not good at that. It's like, if you just stop saying that, you would be. And I know it's not mm -hmm. that simple. So talk to me about how do you identify where, like what somebody's self-limiting beliefs might be in the hiring process? Because that feels like that this particular person it took me a long time to figure out oh that's what you're running into yeah I couldn't yeah it took me a while to figure that out so how, how do you have like some sort of voodoo doll is there like a seance that you do and like this magical powder that comes you know like how well so well my my magic tool is omg i will swear by amg again we've been very successful with our business and recruiting salespeople because omg so for people out there listening omg is amazing. I would 100,000% recommend it. So OMG does kind of give you a lot of insights into self-limiting beliefs. But in terms of what I look for in the hiring process, this is where you hear what people say. All right. And you get a ton of insights into what is it that people say and how do they feel about a certain behavior. As an example, I was interviewing a candidate for one of our clients. Our client, what they do is they're a they're a pen manufacturing company, all right? They manufacture high-end pens. And so in interviewing the salesperson, I asked him, well, what interested you about this particular company? And he said, oh, well, you know, I like the fact that it's an outside sales role. However, I went online and I saw that your pens are really expensive. I don't know why anybody would buy a pen that's more than $200, but that's kind of what I thought. Point blank, he said that. Right. So now I have a candidate who believes that a 200 pen 
is expensive. And he is interviewing for a company who sells this $200 plus hen, right? How do you think that person is going to perform in the sales process, right? This person, if I believe $200 for a pen, high-end pen is expensive, and I get in front of my prospect, and I'm in the prospect's like, you know what, $200 for a pen is really expensive, and I believe that myself, what's going to happen? I'm going to say, you know what, I agree with you because I think the same thing. So the last thing you're going to be doing is closing. And so at that point, that we get into different things, right? We get into things like discounting. We get into things as lack of confidence. We get into stalling of the sales process because I have this belief, right? And so in the hiring process, it's much more important for you to hear what is it that people say, because it's in what people say that tells you what they believe and what the, you do what you believe at the end of the day, right? And so again, if I believe $200 is very expensive for a pen, then by the time I get down to execute, I'm not going to execute as well as I should, right? Same thing as another belief that we see salespeople have in the hiring process is a lot of salespeople believe that they have to reach out to the end user first, right? Oh, no, I can't call in the CEO yet. I got to call in the admin first, right? Well, that's a belief, right? And if you continue to have that belief, then what are you going to do? All you're going to do is call in the admin and the admin is not the one who signs the check. And that's really the person that you need to be talking to as a CEO, Right. And so it's hearing, right? Um, Non-limiting beliefs, DNA, skill set, commitment, motivation. You got to see what people do versus self-learning beliefs is really listening to what is it that people say. Love that. Can you, you know, um, belief in the product is certainly one. Belief in their ability to sell to the CEO, totally another one. Um, something I certainly didn't have in the early days of my career. Kind of that, that was one that was a little bit later to develop. What are some other self-limiting beliefs that you look out for? Yeah. So um, a big one is money, right? Most people get stuck on money, right? And there's a lot of psychology behind that, right? We Most people were raised that it's rude to talk about money. And then now we go out and get a job in sales and I'm going to ask people how much money they want to spend on stuff, right? So it's that belief of it's rude to talk about money, but now I got to ask you, right? So a lot of times that we see on, on the belief side, we see people who believe that a certain amount of money is too much money, right? Which again, is the example that I just shared is maybe I have a belief that 50K is a lot of money and I sell $200,000 solutions. How am I going to show up at that conversation? I want to be scared because I got to ask you for 200K and I think 50K is a lot of money to me, right? So that level of confidence and skills is not going to be there. The other uh, usual belief that we see from candidates is, again, a lot of them believe that it's okay for people to go out and think it over. And so if I believe that it's okay for a person to comparison shop, or it's okay for you to go out and get the best deal, and I myself do that in my own personal life, then by the time I get in front of my prospect, what's what am I going to tell the prospect? I'm not going to argue against my own data right? Because I myself believe the same thing. And so these beliefs, these scripts that we tell ourselves throughout the process, right? That we in our heads we have is what we're going to develop and we're actually going to execute in the sales process. The other piece too that we oftentimes hear, um, especially from a sales management side, we we see a lot of sales managers who give their, their self-limiting beliefs to their salespeople, right? They'll say, and I've actually had a couple of times had this for managers, is they'll flat out tell salespeople, listen, you are not going to close anything between this time and this time. And if you're constantly, I know it's the worst, and if you're constantly sharing that message to your salespeople, then sooner or later they're going to buy into it, right? And then that belief is what's going to stop them from doing the behavior versus saying, listen, that is BS. You can absolutely sell during those specific amount of times. And so that belief, right, also becomes a belief for them. And then therefore the behavior changes. So. I'm writing this down. I love it. You mentioned something earlier, kind of last question on this, this topic, and then we'll kind of get to talking about improved growth. You mentioned something about sales DNA. Talk to me about what, what is sales DNA and uh, yeah, how do I look for it? Yeah. So sales DNA, simple terms, is the 
it, it's the internal strengths and weaknesses that we have, right? It's, again, we all have them. You have them, Colin. I have them. Um, everyone has them, especially from a cell side, right? We all have DNA. And the level of DNA could either be very low, could be very high. And DNA is either going to support or sabotage your success, right? The stronger your DNA is, the more likely you are to execute on those skills. The lower your cell's DNA is, the less likely you are to execute on those skills. And so the way that I, it's it's made up of five different components of cell's DNA. All right. So we look at need for approval. One of the other things that we look for is whether or not that person gets emotionally involved throughout the process. We find that a lot of sales people who get emotionally involved throughout the process, they are not able to ask hard questions. They're not able to stay in the moment. They're strategizing in their head a lot of times versus being in the moment and asking the right questions, right? So that's one of the things that we look for. The other thing that we look for is, are they able to talk about money? What level of self-limiting beliefs do they have? Um, can they deal with rejection, right? And so you take all of those components and you average them out and it gives you the cells DNA piece, right? And so the one of the questions that I oftentimes get from our clients is, great, we have someone who has a lot of skills and they have okay cells DNA. What do we do with them, right? And the question, the answer is you coach them, right? Skills are taught through training. Cells DNA is developed through coaching, right? So you mentioned earlier that you had a salesperson, right? There was a salesperson that came to mind. And the best way to address those people who, you know, they can do the things yet they're not doing it is through coaching, right? And truly understanding, hey, Colin, you've gone through training. You know what to do. You know the questions to ask, yet you're not doing it. What's stopping you from doing that? And you might find that it's their need for approval. And so it is my job as a sales manager to flip the script for them and help them think of another way and another reason why they should not have that need for approval that's stopping them from having success. I remember when I first started out as a salesperson, um, my sales manager at the time um, knew that I wasn't able to talk about money, right? And so one of the things that he flipped was, listen, I need you to talk to about money with anyone and everyone. The more comfortable you get at talking about money with everyone and anyone, the more comfortable you're going to be talking about money by the time you get in front of the prospect, right? Mm -hmm. And at the time, as a young 20-year-old starting out in this business, I was scared. But again, the more I talked about money with my family, with my mom, with my boyfriend at the time, the better I got at talking about money with the prospect, right? And so when it comes to DNA, when it comes to strengthening those weaknesses, it is our job as sales leadership to truly focus and work on our salespeople to develop those skills. Amazing. You've clearly learned all of this by doing it. And I really appreciate you coming on and sharing. I'd love if, you, if we could just spend a couple minutes talk to me about the type of work that you do at Improve Growth. And if people are interested in getting in touch, what's the best way for them to reach out? Yeah, for sure. So Simple terms, what we do is we teach companies how to hire sales talent, right? Again, we started out as a recruiting company. I know, shocking. I know. Could you believe it? I was going to say, you should do that. <laughs> <laughs> so for, the, for, for a long time, we've gone out and we recruited people and we've been so successful. And I, again, I completely nerd out on this and this is what I love to do. And I thought to myself and I said, you know what? I love doing it. I love going out there and fishing for companies. But now we want to go out and teach companies how to do it, how to fish for themselves, how to ask the right questions, how what to look for. Um, again, coming in from a sales training background helps because I have that teacher in me. And so what we do is we teach companies how to hire sales talent. So part of what we do is we teach companies the process that they need to be using to really filter out people to get to that one person who can and will succeed. Um we teach them how to ask the right questions, how to ask those questions, what to look for, what's the criteria, how to map out those job descriptions. So anything that has to do with hiring salespeople is something that we help companies with. I love that. Brisa, thank you so much for coming on the show. What's the best way for, for people to get in touch? Is it through LinkedIn, email, your website? Yeah, LinkedIn is the best one. I'm, I'm very active on it. Um, if you can't reach me on LinkedIn, I've been out for the last three months because I just had a baby, so I'm still catching up for messages. But if 
for whatever reason, I happen to not be available, not because I'm having a baby again, but if I happen to not be available, um, website's always great. And that's www.improve-growth.com. Love it. Brisa, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Colin. It's great. And thanks everybody for listening. We'll see you all next week.